If it's Tuesday, with three weeks until Election Day, President Biden tries to re-energize Democrats with a vow to codify Roe v. Wade as candidates spar on the debate stage over the economy, crime, and more, with control of Congress hanging in the balance. Plus, confronting Trump as some conservative candidates speak out against the former president, we'll speak to one of them whose race is now squarely in Mr. Trump's crosshairs. And smoke rises over Kyiv. The White House condemns Russian war crimes as new rounds of airstrikes rock Ukraine's capital city and its power stations, causing massive blackouts all across the country. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We are just three weeks out from the midterm elections, and President Biden appears to be trying to turn back the clock to earlier this summer when Democratic voters were riding a wave of midterm enthusiasm over the backlash to the Supreme Court's overturning Roe v. Wade. This afternoon, speaking at what the White House called a political event, Biden pledged to fast-track an abortion rights bill if Democrats hold on to control of Congress, pleading with voters to remember how fired up they were just a few months ago. I'm asking the American people to remember how you felt, how you felt that day the extreme Dobbs decision came down and Roe was overturned after 50 years. I want you to remember that the final say does not rest in the court now. It does not rest with extremist Republicans in Congress. And finally say, finally say about your right to choose that it rests with you. And if you do your part and vote, Democratic leaders of Congress, I promise you, will do our part. The president appears to be hoping or perhaps wishing that voters' interest in the issue has not peaked, even while others like Senator Bernie Sanders have urged the party to expand its messaging as gas prices are once again on the rise and inflation remains stubbornly high. But as November draws closer, the issues that will ultimately drive voters to the polls may depend on where you are and who you ask? That was the clear takeaway from three key debates last night, including in Battleground Georgia, incumbent Governor Brian Kemp and Democratic challenger Stacey Abrams clashed over crime and gun laws. The men and women in law enforcement want a governor that is going to stand with them, who has been with them, not only to have their back, but also stand shoulder to shoulder on things like civil unrest and going after street gangs and human traffickers. Street gangs aren't the reason people are getting shot in grocery stores and in parking lots and at schools. Street gangs are one part of the problem, but we have a governor who has weakened gun laws across this state, flooded our streets with guns by letting dangerous people get access to those weapons. And in battleground Ohio, Senate candidates sparred over inflation in the economy as Republican J.D. Vance tried to tie Democrat Tim Ryan to his party's leadership. That rising energy price that people see at the pump, that they see in the utility bills, that our farmers see when they're paying more for diesel, that was the direct result of policies enacted by Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi and supported 100% by Tim Ryan. If okay. I may, I mean, yes. J.D., you keep talking about Nancy Pelosi. If you want to run against Nancy Pelosi, move back to San Francisco and run against Nancy Pelosi. You're running against me. Fireworks there and in Utah's Senate race, where a Democrat isn't even on the ballot. Republican Mike Lee and independent challenger Evan McMullen clashed over election integrity. You advised spurious so-called legal efforts to mislead tens of millions of Americans that the election had been stolen. And congratulations, you succeeded. As recently as this year, and even tonight, you're still casting doubt on the legitimacy of the election. No, you're, doing a, you're doing a tremendous disservice to this country, Senator Lee. You have betrayed your oath to the Constitution with this. You know that's not true. You, you sir, owe me an apology. In the days leading up to January 6th, when the votes were going to be open and counted, I had a job to do. There were rumors circulating, suggesting that some states were considering switching out their slates of electors. The rumors were false. On that basis, I voted to certify the results of the election. That exchange comes as a New York Times Siena poll shows 39 percent of registered voters say they are very or somewhat comfortable voting for a candidate whose positions they support, but who believes the 2020 election was stolen.
Mike Memoli has the latest after President Biden's address on abortion today. NBC's Blaine Alexander is on the ground in Atlanta, Georgia. Jesse Kirsch is in Youngstown, Ohio. And Steve Kornacki is, of course, at the big board to break down the numbers on what issues are driving voters in this home stretch. We do want to begin with Mike, though. So, Mike, talk about the strategy behind the messaging today. Obviously, the president has been talking about the economy as well. But this was a moment where he was doubling down on the message of abortion and really making a key promise to voters. Some people wondering what took so long. That's right, Kristen. And I thought really, as I was covering that speech today at the Howard Theater here in Washington, one of the most striking comments the president made was the one that you played earlier, where he asked the audience to remember how they felt when the Dobbs decision came down. That was at uh, the end of June. And I think implicit in the president's question there uh, was the reality that many Democrats are seeing, which is the enthusiasm, the surge in the polls that Democrats experienced across the board in the late summer months because of that decision has begun to subside somewhat. And Kristen, you and I have talked to Democrats uh, who felt that the White House's response at that moment did not necessarily meet the urgency of the moment. They wanted to see more from the administration. Obviously, the president's his response has always been, we need to have the votes to codify Roe versus Wade, that no executive action is going to be a substitute for that law. And so what you saw today from the president, and the strategy really is to make it that much more explicit, to provide a clear deliverable to incentivize Democrats to get out to the polls at a time when there are so many other issues crowding the agenda to say, if we do not just keep the House, but add to the Senate majority, and that's key, add to the Senate majority, then we will make this the first priority in the, in the Congress next year. I will sign it by the end of June. Those additional votes are key because Democrats tried to pass a bill to codify Roe versus Wade this year, but Democrats stood in the way. They don't have the votes to overcome that filibuster, to carve out an exception to the filibuster for reproductive rights. So the president using the bully pulpit that he has to make that issue front and center again. Yeah, and Mike, you know, I've been talking with uh, administration officials, Democrats, who make the case that, look, the president is still going to continue to talk about the economy. He's going to be talking about gas prices, for example, tomorrow. What is your sense about how they're going to walk this fine line? Because clearly abortion is key to Democrats' closing argument in these final weeks. Kristen, I think the strategy is, is quite clear when you look at where the president is saying what. So today in Washington, he's speaking to a national audience, speaking especially to Democratic base voters about abortion rights. But we saw that New York Times Siena poll, we've seen others like it, that show the number one issue for voters, the swing voters who are going to decide these elections, is the economy. And so I just came back from the West Coast. The president was campaigning for Democrats out there, talking about inflation in Orange County, talking about uh, the infrastructure law in Los Angeles, talking about the chips bill earlier in Poughkeepsie. That's the economic message that Democrats say they need to also be carrying to voters in these swing states. All right, Mike, as always, fantastic reporting. Really appreciate it. Blaine, let me turn to you. Uh, you obviously were tracking the gubernatorial debate last night in Georgia. Fireworks there. Um, it came as early voting got underway. What was your big takeaway? What were the big highlights? You know, I think from a big picture perspective, Kristen, when you look at last night's debate, it was actually a pretty substantive debate. You know, one thing that we didn't see between the two candidates is any sort of personal blows back and forth. Really, this is a campaign or this is a race where there, you haven't seen a lot of personal drama, for lack of a better term. You haven't seen a lot of personal issues insert themselves. So, yes, while there were a number of fireworks, blows back and forth, all of them dealt really with policy issues. So when you kind of look at the recurring theme, I think what we saw is Governor Brian Kemp doing during the debate, what she's done all along, which is really lean heavily on his four year record as governor uh, and essentially uh, pointing to those things as things that he's done that have benefited Georgia. And then on the other side, we saw Stacey Abrams uh, issue rebuttals of that at every turn saying, you know what, here's why that actually wasn't such a good thing. And here's what I'm going to do instead. One thing that they spoke really heavily on was the economy. Brian Kemp making the case that business is doing well here in Georgia. And he said repeatedly that in his, in his words, it's because of his decision to reopen Georgia, to reopen the state uh, as one of the first reopenings back during COVID lockdowns in April of 2020. Well, Stacey Abrams pushed back on that and said it came at a cost, pointing out the number of Georgians who died during the pandemic. Uh, another thing that they really sparred over was guns. Of course, Brian Kemp uh, touting the bill that he signed earlier this year into law that removes the requirement for people to hold a permit to purchase a firearm. He says that that makes people safer, that they're able to protect themselves 
themselves. Stacey Abrams says no, that actually puts guns into the hands of people who don't need them. She cited the spa shooting, the Atlanta spa shootings last year as an example. So a lot of back and forth over that. One thing that Abrams was questioned on, however, was polling. As you know, polling has consistently showed her lagging Brian Kemp to different by different margins. She said that polling is simply a snapshot, and she says it's a question of who it's taking a picture of, uh, saying that when she goes around the state, she sees a lot of people with a lot of enthusiasm. Kristen. And, and Blaine, I know you've been tracking some of those early voting numbers. We're getting our first indication of how day one went. What are you hearing? a lot of turnout. In fact, record-breaking turnout on first day when it comes to midterm turnout on uh, day one of early voting. More than 131,000 people cast a ballot yesterday. Kristen, that's nearly double what we saw back in 2018, and that's approaching uh, 2020 years, a presidential year, so that's pretty notable, too. A couple of bits of context, though, that I want to insert into that. One, there are many more people who are registered to vote now, about 1.6 million more voters now than in 2018, so the number of registered voters has gone up significantly. The other Another thing to point out, too, is I've spoken to Democratic sources is, yes, typically that bodes well for Democrats, but this year we've really been seeing Republicans, specifically Brian Kemp, urging his supporters to come out and vote early as well. He did it during the debate. He's done it on the campaign trail as I've been along with him. He did it earlier this morning in a media appearance. So it's certainly interesting, not just the number of people who's turning out, but who exactly is turning out that really will kind of tell the story of what these numbers mean for the race. Christine. That will tell the tale. That is such great context, Blaine. Thank you so much for that. Jesse, let me go to you in Ohio. You were obviously tracking the big debate there overnight between Congressman Ryan and J.D. Vance, and it actually got heated and even emotional at some moments. Tell us what your takeaways were. Yeah, and Kristen, this frankly at points was ugly, awkward, and above all, personal. At one point, J.D. Vance early on invoking Tim Ryan's wife, the Democrat, uh, has an ad out talking about only agreeing with his wife 70% of the time, trying to make a point about agreeing with people across the aisle, finding compromise. And, and Ryan was then, uh, was uh, th then we had Vance saying that Ryan agrees with his wife 70% of the time, but Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. That must get awkward at home. So that was early on. And then later on, uh, things got personal again with Vance invoking his own biracial children uh, when being accused of being tied to racist elements and the great replacement theory, uh, which is a, a racist theory that is out there and both candidates were asked about. I want to play part of that exchange for you. I'm your guy, this, this right? Great, so. This great replacement theory was the motivator for the shooting in Buffalo, okay. where that shooter had all these great replacement theory writings that J.D. Vance agrees with. Some sicko got this information that he's peddling with, again, those extremists that he runs around with, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ted Cruz, all these guys, they just want to stoke this racial violence. Yeah, here's exactly what happens when the media and people like Tim Ryan accuse me of engaging the great, great replacement theory. I'll tell you, you exactly, peddling it. I'll you tell you exactly peddling what happens, Tim. What happens is that my own children, my biracial children, get attacked by scumbags online and in person because you are so desperate for political power that you'll accuse me, the father of three beautiful biracial babies, of engaging in racism. And this is one example of uh, among several last night, Kristen, where both men were trying to paint each other as extremists. And I think that is a message both campaigns are going to try to continue to push because clearly uh, it looks like moderate Republicans could make the difference here. And depending on how many Congressman Tim Ryan can peel off and convince to join him and flipping the seat for the Democrats, Kristen. Yeah. And Jesse, you talked about the fact that it got personal. It certainly did in that moment proves it very well. Jesse Kirsch, thank you so much. Steve Kornacki, let's turn to you at the big board. So we've been talking issues, issues, issues. Walk us through what issues are driving the conversation in these final weeks of the campaign. Yeah, well, you heard uh, Mike there at this top mention this new New York Times Siena poll that I think has gotten a lot of attention out in the last 24 hours. Looking at that question that they asked here, basically, hey, what is voters? What is the top issue that's on your mind as you make your choice in the midterm election? And you see here the economy, inflation, the only two issues 
that hit double digits. And in fact, if you if you combine those two, the economy and inflation as sort of related, 44 percent. I mean, we're getting close to half of the electorate here in this poll. 44 percent saying the economy or inflation. That's the top issue for them uh, when it comes to making up their minds here. Again, nothing else in double digits. You look at abortion, all the emphasis you're talking about, the Democrats have placed on this, the millions of dollars they're spending on ads around the issue of abortion clocks in at 5% in this poll in terms of being a top choice for voters. Well, I, and Steve, I wonder, just to follow up with you on that, and it's funny because you have the first column and then abortion is on the second column. Did reaction to Dobbs peak too soon for Democrats? It's interesting. One way to look at this, let's throw up the poll average here. This is the real clear poll average here. The generic ballot. This is just the question here of asking folks, Republicans, Democrats, who do you want to see control Congress? And this is just the average at any given day of where that poll's been. And I think this trend line does tell an interesting story because you can see we're going back here to May 1st. So go back to the start of the spring and Republicans led the generic ballot by about four points. And this is when we were talking about the midterm climate was very friendly to Republicans, hostile to Democrats. And then what happens is the Dobbs decision comes down somewhere in here at the end of June. And you can see that the trend line tightens to the point where at the beginning of August, Democrats actually got ahead in the generic ballot. It went from the Republicans with a healthy lead, the Dobbs decision, and by the middle of the summer, the Democrats had the lead. And you see they kind of battled back and forth, even a moment there in September, for much of September, uh, first half or so of September, the Democrats continued to lead the generic ballot. But you can see in the last couple of weeks here, it's moved back in the Republicans' direction. It now sits at just more than a two-point advantage for Republicans in the generic ballot. The last two weeks have brought new focus on inflation, bad news on inflation, gas prices that have started to tick up again. And it almost feels as if that economic news is really taking center stage again. And perhaps that focus on Roe over the summer, not as much. And the trend line responding to it potentially. Yeah, certainly does seem that way. Steve Kornacki, so fascinating as always and great to see you. Appreciate it. Coming up, Colorado's Republican Senate candidate Joe O'Day just became former President Trump's latest target on the campaign trail. We'll hear from the candidate and dive into what it means for the future of the Republican Party. Plus, massive blackouts across Ukraine as new Russian shelling takes out critical infrastructure. We're going to have the very latest from Kyiv. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Well, in this country, running for office outside of the traditional two-party system is frequently an exercise in futility. But this fall, independent candidates are hoping they can shake up some key races. In Oregon, the third-party bid by Betsy Johnson has appended the race for the governor's mansion in a state that Joe Biden won by 16 percentage points. Meanwhile, in Utah, independent Senate candidate Evan McMullen has rattled Republican Mike Lee's re-election campaign. McMullen is running as an alternative to Trumpism in a state Trump won by more than 20 points. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale has a closer look. I'm not going to Washington if we prevail to be a bootlicker for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Evan McMullen isn't kidding himself. I think party still does matter. He's just hoping Utah voters can put it aside. I'm a registered independent. At least for now. I don't care what your party affiliation is. I don't care who you voted for in the last election. You know, if you are committed to our core ideals as a country. His long shot bid against incumbent Trump-backed Senator Mike Lee is as much about Utah as it is about the future of the Republican Party, one McMullen used to call himself a part of. There's no going home to Donald Trump for true conservatives. <laughs> Thank In 2016, you. McMullen you, ran as an independent so for that reason. And Lee, his now opponent, actually voted for him then. But times have changed. Are you ready to stand with me and millions and millions of others who want four more years? Yeah. Unlike most third-party candidates, McMullen's in a one-on-one -on -one race. Democrats staying out of it. I think it's important to, to look at the reality of the races that we're running. A Democrat was not going to win the Utah Senate race. It comes as 39% of Americans say they're disillusioned with a two-party system that, nevertheless, still reigns supreme. 
In Ruby Red, Utah, McMullins is an uphill climb. But that's not unusual for independent candidates running in a political landscape so often cast in red versus blue. And McMullen's not the only one trying to upend the political status quo in 2022. Betsy Johnson's running as an independent for Oregon governor, a state that's elected Democrats to the job for the last 32 years, but is now rated a toss-up, in large part because of Johnson. I'm not a D, I'm not an R, I'm an O. I am responsible to and responsive to Oregonians. With a message that doesn't stick to the party line. I believe in a woman's right to bear arms and I believe in a woman's right to bear children when she chooses. Which is, of course, the point. Independents choose to do it the hard way. The, the two um, entrenched parties come with their own base of support, their own base of money. But that's also been enough to turn some people away. In Missouri, conservative John Wood briefly entertained a bid for Senate to ensure controversial Republican Eric Greitens didn't win the seat. When Greitens lost the primary, Wood dropped out. And ousted GOP Congresswoman Liz Cheney also toying with an independent bid. This one for president. I certainly will do yeah. whatever it takes to make sure Donald Trump isn't anywhere close to the Oval Office. But in 2022, independents could cause big election surprises. This is a political realignment, what we're talking about. Even if they don't stay outside the parties forever. Right. Is it a temporary realignment for you? It's hard for me to look beyond November, to be honest. I don't know sort of where I'll be from a party affiliation perspective, you know, 10 years from now. I just have no idea. And our big thanks to Ali Vitali for that great report. Joining me now is another candidate who's trying to steer his party in a more moderate direction, Colorado Republican Senate candidate Joe O'Day. Mr. O'Day, thanks so much for being here this afternoon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I want to start off by getting your reaction to some criticism you just got from former President Trump, comments he made yesterday. He called you a rhino and he wrote, quote, MAGA doesn't vote for stupid people with big mouths. As you know, more than 1.3 million Coloradans voted for Mr. Trump in 2020. So what do you say to those Trump supporters who might say, how can we get behind Joe O'Day if, Mr. Pre if former President Trump is saying that? Look, uh, I'm a contractor. I'm not a politician. My wife and I started business out of our basement. We live the American dream here in Colorado. And, uh, you know, I I'm not a politician. And uh, I respect the president's opinion. Uh, he's entitled to that. But I'm like most Americans. Uh, we want to move the country forward. Uh, I don't want to see Biden and Trump again in 2024. That's moving the country backwards. There's a lot of good Republican candidates that are going to enter this primary, you know, DeSantis, uh, Nikki Haley, uh, Pompeo, we got Tim Scott. These are wonderful people that can serve for eight years. And I'm going to actively campaign for one of those to, to come across the finish line as a Republican nominee here in Colorado. And, and that's how I'm going to vote. Mr. O'Day, let me just follow up with you, because, of course, former President Trump is still the leader of the Republican Party by most accounts. And, and his opinion and his message is essentially that he doesn't think you should be in the Senate. What should Republican voters in Colorado take from that? Look, I, I've been on the campaign here 18 months. I've been out to talk to all four corners of the state. We've built an enormous tent. Uh, there's a lot of supporters that are Trump supporters, they're GOP supporters, they're independents, uh, they're disenfranchised Democrats. They're behind this campaign. We're going to do a great job for Colorado. I'm not going to be owned by any party. I'm going to vote for Colorado first. That's what's important to Coloradans. They want to see us move the country forward, and that's what I'm going to do. And We're going to win in November. I'm confident. You know, I, I'm curious, you said in your response to former President Trump that essentially another Biden-Trump election would tear this country apart. What specifically did you mean by that, Mr. O'Day? We're ready to move this country forward. We need we need some independent thinkers that are going to talk about the issues that are really important to working Americans here. I'm talking small business owners, middle class. Those people are getting crushed right now by these Biden policies. Uh, we've got to turn that over, around. Uh, inflation's record high. You've got crime here in Colorado. We're number two in violent crime. We're number two in fentanyl overdoses. We're, we're ready to move this country forward. We want some independent thinkers that are going to move this country forward, and that's who I'm going to get behind, and that's how we're going to change things here in Colorado. Well, you've led me to my next question, which is about the issue of inflation. If you are elected into the U.S. Senate, what specifically would you do to try to bring spending down? What would be the first piece of legislation that you would sponsor? 
Well, it's pretty simple. We got to quit spending. We don't have a taxation problem. We got a spending problem and we got to quit. The other thing is this war on uh, American energy. It's got to end. Uh, we need good fossil fuels. We need to develop a uh, great American gas here uh, in Colorado. We've got a huge source and we need to flood the market so we can lower the price. It's a pretty simple math problem. When there's a huge supply, the numbers go down. I'm just a carpenter, but I can figure that out. W would you support making the Trump era tax cuts permanent? Of course, we need to keep those moving forward. That's how you grow your business. Uh, I, I've been a business including on the wealthy, Mr. O'Day. Just to, just to be clear, including on the wealthy and large corporations. When you, when you lower the taxes on businesses, they reinvest. They can pay their employees more. When they lowered my taxes, what I did is I reinvested in my company. I bought new equipment. We got more efficient, and I was able to pay my people more. They had huge wage gains during that uh, period of time. We need to go back to that. That's what's important. That's what working Americans want. We need to get these wages up. Under the Biden uh, tax, the, the, the Biden inflation tax, we've taken a 10% haircut on our buying power here in Colorado. We're number two in inflation in Colorado, 15.6%. It's gobbling up uh, working Americans. We can't take it much longer. Mr. O'Day, I know that as you just talked about, you want to see um, cuts to spending as well. Where would you find those cuts? Would entitlements be on the table? Social Security, Medicare, where do you find them? Look, I'm going to protect uh, Social Security. We're not going to tap that. We need to be looking at these bureaucracies. Under the uh, Biden-Bennett regime, they just managed to put 87,000 IRS agents, IRS uh, bureaucrats in place. Uh, that's, that's not where we need to be focused. I mean, that's $80 billion that we could be using to maybe shore up our border, maybe shore up our, our, our Medicare, Medicaid. There's a lot of good places to put that money besides shaking down working Americans. So, so just to be clear, no cuts to Social Security or Medicare? No, no, okay. not at all. Those people earn that money. They put paid in. They deserve to be paid. And I'll stand behind that as, as your senator. Well, as you know, uh, some within your party have suggested using the debt ceiling or potentially shutting down the government in order to extract some of those concessions that you're talking about, particularly on spending. Is that a tactic that you would support? Look, when we shut down for COVID and we heard that 60 percent of federal employees uh, we're deemed non-essential. That isn't going on at any business that I've talked to. There's plenty of fat there. We need to focus on the bureaucracies and making sure that we shrink them. And that's how we're going to go about it. Let me ask you about your position on abortion. Back in 2020, you signed a, a petition that sought to ban abortion in Colorado after 22 weeks. And you now say you believe abortion should be legal through 20 weeks of pregnancy, after which the procedure should only be allowed in cases of rape incest or the health of the mother. What do you say to Coloradans who might be concerned you're going to shift your position yet again? I've always been opposed to late-term abortion. Uh, I believe, in, as a senator, though, that uh, for the first five months, that decision belongs between a woman and her doctor. After that, exceptions of rape, incest, life of the mother, medical necessity, that decision also belongs but between a woman. will your position and shift I'm, moving forward, Mr. Shift. O'Day? It will not shift, and I'm going to vote that way. And I can tell you, Michael Bennett believes in abortion up to and including the moment of birth. Uh, that's extreme. L let me ask you uh, about the January 6th committee, because as you know, they have said that they plan to subpoena former President Trump. We all saw them take that vote at the end of their last hearing. Do you think former President Trump should comply with the subpoena? Look, President Trump's going to do what President Trump wants to do, uh, and, and that's his decision, not mine. I, I believe that was a black eye. I don't think it was a good day for America. It's time to move us forward. That's why I don't want Biden or Trump to run again. Let's move this country forward. Mr. O'Day, quickly, though, just, just yes or no, for the sake of transparency, obviously the, the January 6th committee hearings have been going on for quite some time now. For voters in Colorado who might be curious to know your position on this, should former President Trump comply? I have been very vocal. He doesn't need to run again. I don't want to see him run again. I'm going to openly campaign against him. And that's where I'm at. All right. Joe Day, Republican candidate for Senate. Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Coming up next, a rising death toll, massive power outages, and pleas for more air defense. We're on the ground in Ukraine after another day of heavy shelling. You're watching Meet the Press now.
Welcome back. Russia continued its shelling of Ukraine today with strikes on a residential building in the south, as well as an attack on an infrastructure facility in Kyiv. Now, according to President Zelensky, 30 percent of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed over the past eight days, resulting in massive blackouts all across the country. The mayor of Kyiv is now urging residents to limit their use of electricity and water as the city works to restore essential services. Joining me now from Kyiv is NBC's Cal Perry. So, Cal, bring us up to speed. What is the latest that you are seeing there on the ground? Well, we're in a darked out city here. The Ukrainian capital is dark. It's partly by choice, partly because of these airstrikes. But what is unfolding here is an energy crisis. And clearly, this is Russia's way of trying to make it unlivable here. They're trying to hit these power substations. As you heard from the president, 30% of them have already been destroyed. If we get to about 40%, rolling blackouts are just going to become blackouts. And as winter months approach, uh, people here are getting very nervous about it. That is, I think, the overall fear. The more immediate fear is, of course, the danger that these rockets and that these drones pose. There were three people killed today in a series of rocket strikes in the capital. You mentioned the city of Nikolaev. The entire apartment building there collapsed, one person dead. And in the north of the country, two people were killed in shelling. So the death toll is rising. And what we're seeing here is this continued air campaign. And look, Kristen, just to give you an idea of what life is like in this city, for the past five days, we've woken up to the sound of explosions. So people are tired. People are weary. School has been canceled. Life has changed here in dramatic ways, Kristen. Mm. All right, Cal Perry, thank you for joining us, and please do continue to stay safe. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Ernst. After the break, all the latest twists and turns from the campaign trail with just three weeks to go. It is the final countdown and the final push to get voters to the polls. My panel's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. One of the most extraordinary parts of that decision, in my view, was when the majority wrote, quote, women are not without electoral, are, are not, excuse me, are not without electoral or political power. Let me tell you something. <laughs> the court and the extreme Republicans who spent decades trying to overturn Roe are about to find out. Welcome back. That was President Biden looking to fire up Democratic voters on the issue of abortion at an event here in D.C. As we mentioned earlier, with Election Day just three weeks away, Democrats are trying to turn back the clock to the summer and the anger over the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. I'm joined now by my panel, Meredith McGraw, national political correspondent at Politico, Eugene Robinson, columnist for The Washington Post, and Republican strategist Brad Todd. Thanks to all of you for being here. So, Meredith, let's talk about what we heard from President Biden today. He literally said, I want you to remember how you felt on the day that Roe v. Wade was overturned. It was almost an admission that they are losing momentum around this issue. What did you hear? Yeah, the, the president's really trying to kickstart the same sort of energy, as you said, that we saw from this summer. And he's trying to make this broader argument among their electorate that uh, they need to be thinking about Republicans pulling back their rights. They need to be thinking about abortion when they go to the polls. And that's really the bet that they're making, is that that's going to be an energizing enough force to overcome what Republicans think. And that's that voters are really just going to be motivated by inflation, by the economy, and by what they're seeing in their bank accounts. Yeah, and Eugene, if you look at the polls, it, it, those issues are really stubborn. They sit at the top of the list for voters. Sure. Do, do you think, is there a sense that Democrats have miscalculated, not by talking about abortion, but by not focusing on other issues like the economy and like inflation as much? Well, you know, the Democrats that I've heard campaigning do talk about the economy. They do talk, you know, they talk about all this stuff and they, they frame it in terms of what the Biden administration and Congress have been doing to try to ameliorate uh, inflation. Um, they talk about their longer term plans. They talk about their, you know, accomplishments thus far. Um, for, you know, 100 days, gas prices were going down and they talked a lot about that when they leveled off and crept up a little bit, um, not so much. But, um, you know, I, I agree with the analysis that it was a huge deal. The Dobbs decision was a huge deal. Um, and I am not convinced. I think, it's, um, I think it's a mistake if Republicans believe, oh, well, that's all past us. That's not going to, you know, that's not going to have any impact. I, that's just my... My hunch. I want to play a little clip from the debate in Ohio last night, and I'm going to get your reaction on the other side, Brad. 
Look, there are a number of different exceptions here. And here's, here's the thing that I want to say here is you, you cannot say with total confidence what every single exception in every single case is going to be. Uh, an incest exception looks different at three weeks of pregnancy versus 39 weeks of pregnancy. So I actually don't think that you can say on a debate stage every single thing that you're going to vote for when it comes to an abortion piece of legislation. You would vote for Lindsey Graham's 15-week ban? As I just said, I think it's totally reasonable to say you cannot abort a baby, especially for elective reasons, after 15 weeks of gestation. No civilized country allows it. I don't want the United States to be an exception. Brad, do you get the sense that some Republican candidates are still struggling with their messaging around this issue, which we have seen be an energizing factor in places like Kansas and the New York special election? Well, I think since the Dobbs decision has came out, what's mm -hmm. happened? Two things have happened. First, the Democrats have spent $97 million on the issue. Republicans have spent less than a million. Uh, so Democrats have attempted to drive this issue over all others. And meanwhile, the polls now are better for Republicans than they have been at any point since June. So the, the campaign efforts for the Democrats have failed. I think that's because Democrats themselves staked out a very extreme position, abortion all the way up into the due dates for any reason at any time, anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's the least popular position on the scale. If you had Democrats running with a much more middle ground position, this might have been a lot more effective for them. And it's still going to energize their base. It's still going to change turnout some. But it's not changed the fundamentals of the electorate like Democrats hope. Yeah, one of the things that you continue to hear Democrats try to make the case, Meredith, is that Republicans haven't put forward a plan to deal with inflation, to deal with the economy. It's, it's notable. Kevin McCarthy, in an interview, um, said this about one of the ways in which he wants to rein in spending. He said, quote, I think people are going to be sitting in a recession and they're not going to want to write a blank check to Ukraine. Ukraine is important, but at the same time, it can't be the only thing they do and it can't be a blank check. Is that something that's going to potentially be a winning message three weeks until the election? Yes, people are focused on what's happening right here. At the same time, they have also been quite focused on Ukraine and willing to support these funding measures that have passed. Well, we've been hearing rumblings from Republicans about this for quite some time, about spending in Ukraine. And I think uh, McCarthy is looking forward and is predicting if Republicans do win the House, he's going to have to deal with a, a conference, a House conference that is increasingly right wing and is increasingly America first, uh, has mm. the same sort of Trumpism bent and is looking for more oversight on uh, spending when it comes to Ukraine. And I think we've seen uh, with McCarthy's statement, really the stark divide uh, in Republican foreign policy on display. Um, you have this, uh, you know, America first wing of Republicans um, who is saying, whoa, let's, uh, you know, look at how we're spending our money, how we're spending funds over in Ukraine. And then you have some of the more traditional Republicans who um, at one point were competing with Biden to be the, the more hawkish when it comes to Ukraine. Well, and, and that's exactly the point. I mean, Brad, does that type of messaging run counter to the argument that Republicans are hawkish? No, no this is, it's more nuanced than this, right? Okay. Republicans are pretty united in being willing to give the Ukrainians advanced weapon systems. But that's not what Joe Biden wants to do. He wants to send checks and cash. And so most Republicans would tell you, send them advanced weapon systems, let Germany send them cash for humanitarian aid. And, you know, everything Joe Biden does costs money. It's, we've already spent $52 billion on Ukraine. Student loan debt reassignment, that costs money. His green energy plants cost money. And Americans are in a time of inflation. They know when the government spends more, it makes inflation worse. That, that's the fundamental perpendicular problem Joe Biden has. Eugene, weigh in on this. Well, um, those advanced weapon systems cost money. I mean, so it's, it's not you know, it's not like you do that for free. Um, you know, this is really important, actually, because the United States has led uh, NATO and Europe and the rest of the world and kept it united in a way that I think, um, you know, I've heard many Republicans say it has been really impressive and has been really uh, a good thing um, for the future of, of democracies and, and, um, and, and you know, countering uh, Russia and, and this, this brazen attempt uh, to take over Ukraine. Now, um, if Kevin McCarthy cannot finesse uh, support from his caucus for this continued policy, that has world implications. It really does. And I, I think back to when um, you know, George W. Bush was president, Nancy Pelosi became speaker. She had to fund the Iraq war. She had, and, mm -hmm. and, um, and she knew she had to do it. And 
all her caucus, like her entire caucus, didn't want to do it. Mm. She found a clever way to do that, so, splitting the legislation into parts, giving people a chance to vote against it, yeah. uh, you know, against the war, but for the money, and she got it through. So you know, when I talk to Republicans on Capitol Hill, they say the problem is the Biden administration doesn't give them any input on their Ukraine policy. They mm. just send it over to the Democrat leadership and expect the votes to come in. What Kevin McCarthy said is no blank check. So that mm -hmm. means transparency, oversight, focus on military equipment. The administration is going to have to come to Republicans next year. One of the things, broadly speaking, that we're going to be watching for um, on election night is the Trump effect. I just talked to Joe O'Day, who's running um, in Colorado, obviously, and he's running against former President Trump. But you have all of these candidates, uh, Herschel Walker, Dr. Oz, um, and J.D. Vance, who we were just talking about, who literally have been backed by Trump, some of them handpicked by Trump. Meredith, what are you seeing in the trend lines there, particularly when you hear from a Joe O'Day who's still very bullish, not not backing down in the face of this criticism from the former president. Yeah, the uh, Joe Day's handling of that has is, is really been um, interesting to watch. You know, I think um, with Donald Trump, we're all still watching to see, of course, whether or not he's going to make any kind of announcement soon. And, you know, I think how some of these candidates that he played such an important role in picking, in um, promoting, um, how they fare could factor into that calculation and maybe how Republicans view the former president. We have less than a minute, so very quickly from both of you. What do you think, Brad? Well, elections are waged in the windshield, not the rearview mirror. We have them about one president at the time, and it's the current president. Uh, the former president is trying to get into the windshield. <laughs> He's trying to do the future as well as the past. If he succeeds in that, that's good for Democrats. All right. Well, great conversation by all of you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great to see you. Coming up next, my one-on-one -on -one interview with Congressman Tom Malinowski, whose race could be a bellwether for who will control Congress as the vulnerable Democrat seeks re-election in one of New Jersey's most competitive races. That's next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we watch results start to come in on election night, one place we'll be keeping a very close eye on is northern New Jersey. That is where Congressman Tom Malinowski, one of the most vulnerable Democrats on the ballot, is trying to win a third term. It's seats like his that Democrats have to win if they want to hold the House. The Cook Political Report rates his newly redrawn district lean Republican. And he defeated his Republican opponent, Tom Keene Jr., by fewer than 6,000 votes two years ago. Now, keep in mind, his redrawn district includes nearly 27,000 more registered Republicans. Joining me now is Congressman Tom Malinowski. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, happy to be here. So the latest polls are showing that Republicans seem to have the momentum right now. And I wonder why you think that is. Is it a failure of messaging, strategy, democratic policies? What do you make of it? Uh -huh. Actually, I don't think that's true. Uh, I've seen some polls that show a slight Democratic advantage. I saw a Fox News poll today that showed that Democrats have the advantage. I don't think anyone has a clue. Uh, I know in my uh, congressional district, I've got a very close race in a district that leans Republican, and yet the polls show it to be tied. There's a significant enthusiasm advantage, I think, on our side uh, in terms of early voting, uh, massive volunteer turnout uh, on my side uh, of this campaign. So I, I feel like at least from where, where, where I sit, we, we're where we need to be. So, Congressman, you, other Democrats, we saw the president today, have made abortion a key issue in this campaign. Uh, and yet, inflation and the economy remain voters' top priorities. So my question for you is, do you worry that you run the risk of over-indexing on the issue of abortion? Or do you think that's the key to turnout and energizing your voters? The key issue is that Republicans have absolutely no plan for fighting inflation, but they do have a very concrete plan for banning abortion. Um, you, you know, I've I've been uh, I've had the same guy running against me for the last four years in my congressional district. Of course, he's emphasizing inflation in all his ads. He's been asked in our debates, "What would you do?" He has no answer. Uh, the Republicans on Capitol Hill have no answer, apart from we're learning in the last few days that they do seem to be preparing to shut down the government again to uh, start eviscerating Social Security 
and Medicare. So, so the, this election, it's not either or abortion or, or, or the economy. It's it's both. Um, Democrats have been doing something about the economy uh, for the last year. And I, I have no idea what the Republican plan is. Well, and you bring up your challengers. So let's talk more specifically about what he has been saying. And frankly, Republicans nationally have been blaming Democrats for spending bills. They say that have contributed to the high inflation. My question for you, Congressman, is why should voters trust inflation won't get worse if Democrats remain in power? They, they have not actually criticized any specific spending. They just talk about spending in general. My opponent well, actually they criticize the series of spending bills that have been passed under this president and under a Democratic-led Congress. Most of them were actually bipartisan. There was there, there was one that was uh, only Democrats, the American Rescue Plan, which in my congressional district enabled uh, our small towns, our municipalities to keep police officers and firefighters employed to keep our property taxes down, which people here appreciate. Um, I had Republican mayors um, uh, contacting my office and leadership in Congress, urging us to pass that bill back when it was happening, because, you know, the economy was in a Great Depression. Do, and do, voters trust the party that brought the American economy out of a Great Depression and that then passed legislation to lower prescription drug prices, lower health care costs. Um, I'm proud to run on the stuff we're actually trying to do to lower costs for consumers. And I can't point to a single thing the Republicans are proposing to do. Congressman, just to put a fine point on it, though, do Democrats bear some responsibility for where the economy is right now? It happened on your watch. Uh, what happened on our watch was taking an economy that had tens of millions of people unemployed and virtually every small business shut down in this country taking it to a point where we rescued the jobs, rescued the businesses, and now we have a responsibility because we are the party in power to deal with inflation, to deal with the cost of living. And again, we are actually trying to do something about that. We're passing bills that lower cost of living. Republicans say they'll cut, that they'll cut spending, right? I guess that's the only specific thing that they've said. Yeah. But if you had a single Republican on your show who's given you a single example of what they would cut, Congressman, let me ask you about one of the issues that uh, has been raised again by your challenger in your race. You remained under investigation by the House Ethics Committee over allegations that you failed to properly disclose hundreds of thousands of dollars in stock trades. You have said that errors were made. It was the result of carelessness. But what is your message to voters who might worry that the investigation raises questions about your conduct and your ethics? Well, the, the investigation was over a year ago. It was, it was a report by uh, the Office of Congressional Ethics, which established, which confirmed everything that, that I'd said, that there was late reporting, that I had no involvement or even prior knowledge of the, the trades that my broker was making. Ever since then, uh, I put my entire retirement savings in a blind trust. I'm one of only about 10 members of the House or Senate who's done that. Um, I strongly support legislation that would prohibit uh, any member of Congress from uh, uh, owning stock. Um, I've took, taken issue with leadership in my own party for not passing that bill. And my opponent, who's brought this up, is actively trading stocks as we speak, pharmaceutical stocks, oil company stocks, uh, even Chinese stocks. Mm -hmm. So if that's the issue they want to run on me on, they, they, they put up the wrong candidate. Let um, Run against. Let me ask you about the future of the Democratic Party. Do you think President Biden should be on the ballot in 2024? Is he the strongest candidate to represent Democrats in the next presidential election? I think there's something wrong with our politics when uh, more than two years before a presidential election, that's the question. Um, I don't want President Biden to make that decision right now. I want President Biden to be focused on inflation, on gas prices, on the war in Ukraine, on protecting the country. We will all, after the midterm elections, take that back and think about that. I, Do you want I'm, him to campaign with you, Congressman? Because that is a, a question for right now, right here and right now. Do you want the president to be campaigning with you in these final weeks of the campaign? I've had the president to my district several times. He, he's come to, uh, to deliver flood relief after Hurricane Ida. He's come to talk about um, the importance of child care and early education. But do you want him in these final weeks of the campaign, Congressman? I'm happy to have anybody uh, come and stand with me to deliver for voters in my district. The former president came to my district repeatedly to play golf. 
All right. Congressman Tom Malinowski, thank you so much for your time and stay safe on the campaign trail. Thank you so much. And thank you for being with us this hour. Chuck will be back tomorrow with a very special edition of Meet the Press Now. You do not want to miss live from Georgia. He'll be talking to voters as they head to the polls, plus one-on-one -on -one with Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, Atlanta Mayor Andre Dinkins, Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, and much, much more. You don't want to miss it. NBC News Now coverage continues with Tom Costello right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.